Hi, today we are in Berlin with Lesara. Roman, who are you and what do you do? That's a good question. So my name is Roman, I'm the founder and CEO of Lesara. Um, you know, a one-year-old startup company, we're close to one year now, and the leading non-branded online discount player in Europe. What did you do before you started this company? I'm familiar with the startup and e-commerce industry for a couple of years now. After uh, graduating, I founded my first company, uh, Kazakanda, which was also catering to a, a similar target group in terms of ages. So we sold to older women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, I, I'm still sticking to selling products and merchandise to older women. I don't know if this is a You're attracted fetish. to women, right? Yeah, 35-year-old uh, <laughs> plus, yeah. <laughs> okay. But um, it was a flash sale site for furniture and home decor. So mm -hmm. we, we helped designers, manufacturers and also furniture brands across Europe to, to target and get access to a new customer group mm -hmm. online in the digital world. The whole industry is very much offline uh, in a flash sales format. So okay. um, we scaled the company quite well, had um, seed investment from Klaus Hommels, Oscar Hartmann, who's the CEO of Kupi VIP. Mm -hmm. And then after around about the year when we were at 50 employees and you know seven, eight million euros of run rate, we had the option to either um, do another big financing round or maybe partner with a bigger uh, you know, company, which mm -hmm. we decided or opted for. So we sold the company to a US company called mm -hmm. Fab.com. Um, and my job was for uh, another 12 months or for, for another year to expand the um, whole business model from Europe, uh, from Germany into 28 other countries in Europe, which I did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I left the company after a year um, you know, traveled a bit, also to the valley, get inspiration. Was was uh, um, invested in a couple of uh, um, seed companies, and uh, you know, if you've been once at the helm of a company and uh, and uh, you know have the spirit and the drive, then and then investing is just not the kind of thing you want to do. You just want to be again an entrepreneur yeah, again, yeah. be be pushy. Uh, sometimes you hate yourself because you have to. You know, you're hungry and it's midnight uh, on Sunday, and you still have a big to-do list but uh, I think that's that was the only way for, for me to be happy again so that's uh, why I founded Lissara September 2013. Okay, right. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us a bit how the business model works and, and yeah. what differentiates you from other e-commerce players? Yeah, so that's actually a good question because from the front end it's probably not that visible. So, um, and I, you know, wh one of my last things um, w w uh, while I was at FAB was actually um, a big initiative that we did to um, establish private label collections. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in the furniture business you have really high average uh, order values, but usually if you're a reseller you only have 30% margins and you can get to 60, 70, partially 80% margin if you just do private label. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Our team traveled to India, Bangladesh, China, all of those manufacturing countries and established own collections. And this was, I think, one of those aha moments when you realize, wow, you know, until recently those manufacturers had five, six, seven different layers between them and actually the European end consumers. Mm -hmm. And now they start to, to get access to the digital world. Mm -hmm. They probably present themselves on Alibaba, which by the way is now bigger, you know, than Amazon and eBay combined. They present themselves on other da databases and get a connection directly to end consumers. Mm -hmm. And this is what inspired me. And this is, I think, one of, one of the, you know, initial points why we started Lasara because we said you know this doesn't really exist for for a target group which is 35 year old plus which values you know a lot value for money products they don't necessarily care that much about brands and this is what they're familiar with in the offline world there's not mm -hmm. one or two there's more than 20 um, billion dollar offline players who are very successful with this yeah. strategy so not only in Germany but across Europe you know um, across categories, there's you know a Primark or a Taco or a Kick in fashion. There's a, a Bijou Brigitte in jewelry. There's a Butlers in home. Mm -hmm. So it's successful across categories. It's successful across countries. And you know that this was one of the you know one of the reasons why we decided if, if those companies from the offline world um, were about to start from scratch in this new digital world, mm -hmm. how would they do it? And this is kind of the initial question that we had with Lazara and what we see now is partially the outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're basically cutting out some of the middlemen from uh, Bangladesh, China to yeah. Germany. Yeah. Um, and other e-commerce players or offline players are not doing this, at least not in this kind of, um, let's, let, let's say, as 
uh, yeah. on a, a much scale as you are yeah. doing it. So I think if if you're a reseller, you're always uh, you know you're mm. always at the short end of, of the table because you always have margin pressures and you are also reliant on your suppliers, right? And on your brands. If mm -hmm. you just sell Adidas, then you can't negotiate the prices further down. Either you take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And um, as you said, our our um, strategy is a bit different for the online world or for pure online players because we work directly with manufacturers and um, a model which works really, really well in the offline world. And um, the other thing that we probably do different is we not only put the whole strategy that offline players do online, we try to make it also a bit smarter and better. Mm -hmm. How, especially with two different things. One is um, we use data for the merchandise selection. Mm -hmm. So we have different crawlers who actually crawl the web and suggest us what's actually selling. And uh, then we produce similar styles um, or have manufacturers produce similar styles for half the price. So um, awesome. this is usually uh, you know something that private label retailers do as well, but they need 12, 18 months to actually make that happen. Oh, okay. So um, because we get the data quite quick and because we don't have a private label, but we work with manufacturers who have all oh, of this merchandise already pre-produced, mm -hmm. we can actually launch in-demand top-selling products in two, four weeks mm -hmm. for half the price. Honestly. This is, I think, one of the big advantages that we have. And the second one is actually the whole uh, topic inventory risk. And that's why I, I wouldn't say that we are a traditional e-commerce player, which you know, takes a big risk by having own inventory and then selling it and then having lots of overstock. How we work is that we actually work with our manufacturers on consignment, which means that, uh, um, and this is something which we can do because you know there's many manufacturers and they are to a certain degree exchangeable, so we have more bargaining power with mm -hmm. those. And uh, what we do is we work on consignment. They put us the merchandise into our stock, into our warehouses. We sell, and whatever we don't sell, we can return. So okay. we don't have the inventory risk, which is which puts us from a dynamics and unit economics perspective more into the marketplace model yeah. with actually private label margins. So the best of both worlds. And having your own brands as well, partially at least. We don't. We don't have our own brands yet. Okay. But um, this is something that you know that's been raised already a couple of times, and I think it's a matter of timing when 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 we consider launching them. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you tell us about the pr product portfolio that you're currently offering and how this matches the preferences of yeah. women uh, 35 yeah. plus? Yeah, our model only makes sense if we have a high visit frequency. Why? Because we sell really low price products, so we're 20, 25 percent below the offline peers, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of pricing. And because our products, are, you know, it's hard to say because our products are mostly exclusive to us. They're not directly comparable with, you know, Amazon products or eBay products. But for comparable products on email and Amazon, you also always pay 20% more. So we're 20% cheaper. Um, however, we, you know, this also imposes challenges because we obviously don't make that much money per order because we have low average order values, low price points. That's why our model only makes sense if we have high visit frequencies mm -hmm. and high um, purchase frequencies, if people buy a lot of merchandise. Mm -hmm. um, how do we do it? I think merchandise is the biggest kicker. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to um, A, have merchandise which we call everyday basics, mm -hmm. um, which you'd normally always, always, you know, just add on into your card. So this is something that, for instance, Chibo as, as an offline mm -hmm. player is doing over four billion dollars in revenues. It's been doing really, really successful because uh, they go out and, and you always go into those stores. You have no idea of what you actually want to buy. Mm -hmm. You browse and then you say, hey, I need this, I need this. So these are leggings or boxers or, or, or sleepwear or home textiles. Th this, these are also kitchen products. These are the things that you always need. Um, and what we add on top is something that we call themed events, mm -hmm. um, which people also know from the offline discounters, um, which which we launch on a seasonal basis. So if, if it's August, we have back to school merchandise. Mm -hmm. If we have, you know, now in April and May, we have lots of outdoor furniture. So it's a mix of basic merchandise, which we have, mm -hmm. and then regularly updated um, new merchandise based on seasonalities. Mm -hmm. Big advantage is that because you have always new regular updated merchandise, people have always a new reason to shop and, and check in right. with you as a store. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you are online for almost a year yeah. and you're saying you, that the customers are purchasing more often yeah. uh, than with other websites. Yeah. Can you do some kind of comparison in terms of uh, what is the, uh, the yeah 
the frequency that yeah. a typical guy is purchasing on your yeah. website compared to other e-commerce websites? Yeah. So I think it, this is one of the biggest drivers. So um, to, for for you know profitability of a business is is obviously the order frequency because mm -hmm. um, uh, unless you're a very transactional business, if you sell I don't know furniture or cars, then you have to be profitable with the first order because you buy only once every five or ten years. For us, people. If they want, they can buy every day. So mm -hmm. for us, the biggest, the big, biggest driver for our profitability and long-term growth is the repeat mm -hmm. uh, buyers. So at the moment, we expect around, I mean, we're live for a year, uh, we expect between um, five to eight purchases in two years, mm -hmm. which compares, for example, you know, there's a couple of companies which, which, you, uh, which you can also benchmark in the online world, which are, for instance, publicly traded. I think yeah. Groupon is around 2.53. Um, then Zulili, which is a really uh, a one of our, um, you know, you know, role models, is around eight. So these are these are so say the benchmarks that we have. Okay, great. So we always try to um, yeah exchange some advice for yeah. first-time entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I mean, you are a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and you are also invested in uh, oh. com companies as a business angel. Uh, what advice can you give first-time entrepreneurs so they get? M can become more successful or don't make as much errors as they yeah. maybe currently do. So <laughs> I think making errors is, is, is not probably the worst thing, as th I think. And um, you see that with the company where we said we have, um, there's three or four things that really matter in the beginning. And one of those things is speed, you mm -hmm. know. If, you know, the internet business runs, it's good that it's raining uh, now. So yeah. you can, can show it the speed. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speed is really, really important, um, not only in the beginning, but over the first couple of years because the faster you are you have to try the test the internet world yeah. is very very fast and this is also one of the key 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 advantages that you have versus more established traditional players so this is i think number one um, number two is um you know we always say we hire smart people but in some in some degrees an entrepreneur needs to be really dumb because <laughs> because uh, he can't be always ra rational you know if if because you always have situations where it's maybe more rational to give up or maybe more rational to say hey that doesn't work but uh, this is i think what makes uh, um, really successful entrepreneurs successful is that they never give up even if it's rationally the yeah. smart thing to do but they just have some stupidity in themselves yeah. in the right uh, points yeah okay right but i think we will give up now because it's really <laughs> starting raining heavily and th thank you very much yeah. roman thanks a lot martin okay and let's run again. please come on <laughs>